So price chart, I think, is the best guide of what the asset is doing, what its trend is, how it, how people are perceiving it, and where it is versus what you might perceive as fair value. So, okay. you know, you, you notice certain characteristics, like crypto tends to be exponential in price. So you put it on the logarithmic chart, it starts to make sense. You know, you look mm -hmm. at things like copper and lumber, they tend to be mean reverting assets because you they get met by excess supply with high, high prices lead to excess supply. So you need to understand the structure of markets, where the sentiment is. Is it overly bearish? Like a day like today, it got overly bearish. And so suddenly you start to see a reversal. So these kind of things are interesting. But my big discovery and why I really started loading up on Ethereum was another chart, which was a understanding that Metcalfe's law was the primary driver of all crypto markets. And in fact, almost all of the tech stocks that we've known today. Right. And once you realize that these are basically networks, and once you realize that crypto are networks where you actually own the network. So Facebook is a great network stock and it works perfectly on a log chart and it's an exponential, does all the things as you imagine. You can value it in Metcalfe's law terms, but the fundamental difference is shareholders and network users are not aligned. The shareholders mm -hmm. make the money, the network users get the utility. Along comes crypto, you ma marry the, the network user with the owner. Okay, now you've got network effects upon network effects. This is like behavioral economics. So I start looking at the fact that Bitcoin and Ethereum charts just at different points when they, at the same point in the adoption cycle were remarkably similar. And then it dawned on me is they're all the bloody same thing. They're mm -hmm. all about adoption. So then, so, so if you look at it and if you're honest with yourself, Ethereum, if you think about Metcalfe's law, it's about the number of users and then the kind of connections between the users and the applications built to create those connections. Well, Bitcoin's kind of a one-sided one, which is a bunch of people own it as a store of value, like gold, nothing wrong with that, but there's not many applications built on it. When you look at Ethereum, it's like, holy shit. I mean, this is like the internet. Right. That moment is like, okay, this is far superior a bet. Um, and so that's why I took that bet. And then I eventually shifted majority into Ethereum and then took other bets in the space to express macro views. Say, let's say, let's look at Web3 as a network and a network of engineers, engineering talent, right? This is where, where it gets really interesting. Why is it exponential? It's because there are parts when everybody's trying to hire Web3 talent, right? We right. are, every single person I know is, right? And the actual pool of people who are capable of doing it is probably like a thousand. Is their <laughs> salaries and the demand for them is exponential. The demand for the network of those guys becomes exponential. Over time, there'll be millions of trained people and it becomes yep. the network effects. The overall space is very valuable, but the opportunity, that ramp, that's right. the single most important, interesting part of network effects. Right. The and the up. fact that you can own a share of the network. So even when the network flattens out and is now worth, I think, $200 trillion for the digital asset space, it's currently $2 trillion. That's 100x in market cap. That's huge. We've never had anything like this before. We want to all get involved in NFTs. You have or no idea <laughs> what's going to win. Right. I mean, I mean, you don't have the ability to go on every Discord. So it's bandwidth constrained. We all are in this space. We know it's huge. We all know it's huge. We also know it's a bubble. We also know tons of this is going to zero. Um, that's fit. What's right. interesting so about ETH, the only ETH gives you the gives you that, the uh, action of, of NFTs. That's the kind of you know that that kind of makes sense. Like owning Oracle did a pretty good job of capturing the internet. Well, my views on Bitcoin changed um, mm. significantly. I don't think you know no less of it as an asset, but. I thought about it in network terms and the community, and I thought the community is not attracting new people. And the job mm. of a network is to attract new participants. And if the network was actively rejecting people, I thought it's going to underperform, um, which was surprising to me because I was very bullish on Bitcoin first because I thought, look, it's going to have a larger place. And what's happened is almost immediately, and it made me change my mind, is the institutions started going, well, I actually don't like this space. Mm. And they started buying ETH. They what don't want hearing? to own an asset where everyone's shouting, have fun, stay poor at each other and putting laser eyes, right? Makes <laughs> them look fucking stupid and irresponsible <laughs> with their money. 
Well, ETH feels like it's a technology play. Yes, it's amusing because everyone's saying GM to each other and all of this stuff, but it's not at war. While Bitcoin was at war with every other network because, you know, that's what networks do. You know, religions go to war with each other for the same reason, right? They're exactly the same <laughs> principles. Um, so, you know, it's the same reason Russia and NATO, I mean, it's the, they're all the same. They're all networks fighting each other for the robustness of their own network. I get it. So that that, that whole process of seeing institutions getting turned off by it was a, was a big deal to me. I just thought, yeah, I don't like this either. So that was one thing. People keep coming to me saying, when's this wall of money? I'm like, it doesn't come as a tidal wave. It comes as a flow, right? right. You don't see it until you look back and go, wow. So, I mean, I literally every other day I'm speaking to the world's largest financial institutions who put me in front of their investment committees and talk them through crypto and how to invest. And the narrative change it really surprised me. It was always Bitcoin. You know, can we put Bitcoin on our balance sheet? How should we invest in Bitcoin? What's the diversification? Move very quick to look, Ethereum feels like it's a technology play that makes right. sense with the applications. We can't, we're interested in DeFi, etc. Then it very quickly became Oh shit, how do we get involved in Web3? Um, so it moved very fast, which is why in the end VC got most of the money um, because they saw the broader opportunity. They all came through the, the 2020 lens of Bitcoin is the asset and you know the, the Michael Saylor route and even me you know, in the earlier part of 2020, a lot of people came in that. And then like all of us, they kind of go, oh wow, okay, this is much bigger. So you know, I've started a fund of hedge funds um, which is invest in, in crypto hedge funds mm. to allow institutions another way into the market because they don't really want to buy just ETH or Bitcoin. They want exposure to this $2 trillion asset class is going to go to $200 trillion over the next 10, 12, 15 years, whatever the number is. Once you win <laughs> something, you don't let somebody else take it away from you. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Because if yeah. I was staking, I get what? 5% yield, or if I'm really clever and I mess around in deep DeFi, I'm getting like a 15% yield, and then I get rugged, yeah. or something goes wrong, or it's on an exchange that gets hacked. I just, that's not the risk I want to take. It's yeah. not worth it if my expected future return is, you know, 10x. Why take, why get a 5% yield? It's nonsensical. So I just don't. I've never been interested in yield. Even in financial markets, all yield stuff is boring to me. I'm, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a guy who likes the capital game route. Yeah. Um, and different people, right? There's a whole bunch of people who love yield. It's called yep. carry in financial markets. They want to get carry and others want to go for performance. And they're two different equations. And the carry guys do really, really well until they blow up. And the, the guys like me tend to do mediocre, mediocre, and then make huge things. They're just different ways of skinning the cat. Right. So I spent my time because we don't have enough mental ability to focus on all the things in the space. So I started going down a different rabbit hole. I saw NFTs. I understood it mainly, not all of it. I understood the, you know, the, 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 the macro view of what these things are and how big this is. So Ethereum introduced a piece of magic in a smart contract. A smart contract attached to a blockchain means that any contract in existence can now be attached to a blockchain. And smart contracts allowed an algorithm or a calculation to be made automatically and verified on the chain. So that could be your insurance contract for your house. It could be any of the contracts. I mean, if you look around you, almost everything that we have in life is a contract. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a spoken contract, or written, me appearing on this together with you is a form of contract, right? So all of these things are contractual relationships that are everywhere. What this was saying is we can record all of them and verify all of them. Okay, so that's a really big concept beyond which most people understand. And you can understand that, okay, if that's the case, then a house can go on a blockchain, yes. Because the deeds, and then you don't need a notary, and then you don't need lawyers, and there's all of this stuff. Right. Most legal stuff can actually go on this. We've got another thing that's going on in digital world, which needs solving. So this contract thing is a big deal. We don't even know what this means yet, right? When we talk in 10 years time, we'll go, oh my God, we didn't even see that coming, right? So that's all happening. And DeFi is that. There's contractual obligations between borrowers and lenders. It's all happening mm -hmm. on chain. But what the, what the, the, 
the average person is seeing is a different breakthrough that came out of this whole concept is in the digital world, everything that gets digitized goes to zero in value or cost. Everything, right? The price of data, the price of everything is zero over time. So that's a big problem <laughs> if you're in, living in an increasingly digital world. So how do you cement digital value is you have to introduce a system of scarcity. And an NFT allows a digital asset to have scarcity. Okay, breakthrough. Now, it could have come from the music industry. It could have come from a number of different places. It ended up being the art market. Mm. Okay. And where you can say, this stuff that was now, was basically worthless online. I mean, Getty had bought a bunch of image rights, but to police it is really bloody hard as well. The next part of an NFT that you say, okay, well, if we give a bunch of people these, we can now identify a community. And then these people can be like-minded communities because they coalesce around an idea, which is this piece of art and this community, which is Bored Ape Yacht Club or CryptoPunks. Mm -hmm. So that becomes incredibly valuable. It's a membership to a club and it's your identification. It's showing your Rolex and you know, it's all of that st stupid identifying tribal stuff that humans do endlessly and <laughs> always have and always will. So that's going on and it allows us, don't forget the internet had taken us from our towns, villages, families, which is our social structure, and thrown us into a big shouting room from people all around the world with different views, right? It's quite exhausting and we all wanted a place. And what this is giving us is these little digital communities, sovereign states, villages, towns, cities, where we can now operate with civically minded people within that. And these tokens are the identifiers. Social tokens are the big thing. They're, they're not, come, they've only just started. That's much bigger, I think, than even NFTs are. But let's start with this, because this is a way of coalescing humans, because humans like these kind of identification, system of shared values, that kind of stuff. So NFTs are a lot of things. That's why they're so big. And again, that's just scratching the surface of what this is. It's your, it can also and will also be your digital identity online.